Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 24th episode of Keep Looking Up from the Ward Beecher Planetarium. My name is Kurt. I am your planetarium engineer. Happy Vernal Equinox, everyone, a few days late. Uh, tonight, we have a great show for you. Uh, we have uh, our planetarium director, uh, Dr. Patrick Durrell, with us this evening, and he is going to be sharing the latest on the on the James Webb Space Telescope. I almost said Hubble Space Telescope, but no, we're talking about the James Webb Space Telescope tonight. Also with us tonight, helping out is my planetarium super staff. Uh, we have uh, Patricia and Jordan, who will be monitoring the comments on Facebook. Say hi, ladies. Very good. And Aubrey is going to be helping me out while we take a look around the nighttime sky at uh, some of the stuff you go see if you go outside tonight. So uh, we hope you will enjoy that. That's how we are going to start off this evening. I do want to tell you that uh, this is only the first of two shows we have this weekend from the Word Beecher Planetarium. Tomorrow afternoon, we actually have something going on in the planetarium itself. Our friends from the Mahoning Valley Astronomical Society uh, will be at the Ward Beecher Planetarium from 3 to 5 for our very popular program, So You Got a Telescope. Uh, you got a telescope, you don't know how to use it, bring it along. They will help you get it set up and show you what you need to do uh, to actually start looking up at the nighttime sky with it. If you are considering buying a telescope, you may also uh, come along and they'll be happy to share information uh, with you about uh, what you should look for when you buy a telescope. So hope to see you anytime between three and five tomorrow afternoon. Uh, with that being said, I need to... Uh, get over to my other screen here. This is walking and chewing gum at the same time. Uh, if Everybody wave one last time, and if you guys at all mute your videos, uh, I will uh, go ahead and start the Star Talk portion of our show uh, this evening. Uh, there we go. And uh, this is tonight, about the time this presentation is going to be over, about uh, 9 o'clock this evening. The reason for that is if I go back to the time it currently is, that's what the sky looks like. We, since we had the time change, uh, everything uh, is uh, still in dusk outside right now, and you're not going to see a lot in the nighttime sky. While I am over here, though, I do want to point out one thing to you. Just as the sun sets, Jupiter is not far behind it. Uh, if you remember uh, the last one of these we did, uh, Jupiter was right next to Venus in the nighttime sky three weeks ago. Well, Junus, Ju Venus has climbed higher and Jupiter has gone lower. So we only have a few more days that we'll be able to see Jupiter at all. Uh, and that will uh, then it will go away as well. But uh, this is the sky as we look to the west. Uh, just at nine o'clock this evening, and you'll see Venus is right here. And if I zoom in a bit, you will also see, by the way, this program I'm using is a free planetarium program called Stellarium. Uh, uh, Patricia or Jordan will post that in our comments for you. Uh, if you're interested in it, it's a great way to start learning the nighttime sky. And in lieu of not being able to use Kronos right now, we're doing this instead. Uh, so you see we have a very, very thin crescent moon out there, uh, which is the second brightest object in the sky after the sun. And Venus is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun, since it is... Um, uh, the nearest planet to the Earth, and it also has those bright clouds uh, there as well. And as I pull back, you'll see the moon is also in front of another planet, one that you will not be able to see, even uh, if you are a dark location when it's this close to the moon. That is Uranus, and I assure you that is how you pronounce the name of that planet. Uranus was the father of Saturn, so he is the god of the sky. So uh, that is where that name comes from. Uh, when you're looking out there in the nighttime sky. As I pull back a little bit more uh, and climb higher in the sky, you'll see the red star Aldebaran here, the red star Betelgeuse right there, more on that later. But just above those two, forming a nice little red triangle, is another planet right there that is Mars in the nighttime sky. So we've got uh, Venus, the Moon, and Mars lined up quite nicely in the early evening sky facing west. And while this W works here in the Stellarium program, that's not going to do you a lot of good outside at night. So 
I am going to uh, pass you off to Aubrey, who is going to tell you how you can find your directions in the nighttime sky. Okay, so um, yeah, not everyone has a nice red N in their horizon. Um, so one way that we can tell which direction we are facing is to look for a very familiar group of stars called the Big Dipper. Um, and we can actually see it there in our Northeast. Um, so that is the rectangle of four stars. And then you have three more that, that make the handle. Um, and that is part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major or the Big Bear. Um, but the Big Dipper is a lot brighter than the rest of the stars in, the, in that constellation. So we can find it a lot easier. But the Big Dipper isn't always directly north. So what we can do is we can take those two stars at the very tip of the cup. And we can draw a line from them down diagonally to a star called Polaris, which is also known as the North Star. And that is because it is usually directly north. The Big Dipper is a set of stars that are what we call circumpolar, meaning that they go around the North Pole. So they actually never set. Um, and so we can always use them to find Polaris and therefore find which direction we are facing. However, some people think that, or I should say, excuse me, I should say first, um, Polaris is actually part of a smaller constellation, which is called Ursa Minor or the Little Bear. Um, it's the kid of Ursa Major, um, which we have the outline right there. Thank you, Kurt. Um, and so it, it, it has a very long tail. If we oh. look at the... <laughs> Sorry about yeah, the giraffe. At, yeah. <laughs> um, the bears look like they're kind of squirrelish, um, but that just has to do with the stories of those, uh, which we have in done in, in other shows. Um, but basically, yeah, those are both of our bears. And again, that's how you can find the uh, direction of north. However, a lot of people think that Polaris is the brightest star in our night sky, and that's not true. It's only known to us because it's in the north. The brightest star is actually in our southern sky right now. I should probably say southeast-ish, yeah. Um, southwest. southwest, excuse me, thank you. Um, and I thought I thought it was farther, my bad. Uh, so, and, and that is the star Sirius, which is part of the constellation Canis Major or the big dog. Um, so that, yep, it's the stars right there. Um, and that, in, in that story that that constellation is connected to, is Orion the Hunter, which I'm sure most, if not all of you know about that constellation that is to the right of Sirius. Um, and we have his three stars that make the belt. And then we have um, Faith that makes his bottom uh, leg or foot. And then we have Rigel, which is that brighter one right there. And then we can go up to that bright red star that is Betelgeuse. And actually in Arabic, that means armpit because that is Orion's armpit. <laughs> so um, that's a, a, a fun fact for everyone to know. Um, and so yeah, Orion is also really a very bright constellation, especially in our winter sky, um, but it is not uh, always in the same place since stars obviously move across the night sky um, and throughout the year. So that's why we don't use it um, to tell us which direction we're facing, even though it is very, very bright. Um, it's fairly high in the southwestern sky now, but we actually only have a couple of months or so that we will be able to use Orion, see Orion in the nighttime sky. The sun is moving in the same direction as Venus and Mars there, and in a few months it's going to be blocked behind this in our summer months. Exactly, yeah. So we have Orion for only a little bit more time, but there is another constellation that's coming in to bring spring in for us, and I'm going to turn it back over to Kurt to tell us about that. Right, we are over here now in the southeastern sky, and you'll notice there isn't as much stuff up in this part of the sky as there is over in the southwest. That's because the southwestern sky is our winter sky. Oh, and it helps if I do that. Anyway, uh, it's over in the southwestern sky. When you're looking in the winter sky, you're actually looking along the plane of our galaxy, uh, so there's more stuff this direction. When you're looking in the spring sky, you're actually looking up and out of our galaxy. So there is stuff this direction, but not that much. 
One of the brightest stars over in this part of the sky is right here. That star is called Regulus. And we find Regulus in a very famous and very distinct constellation known as Leo the Lion in the nighttime sky. Once again, I apologize for these extraneous outlines up here. I can't figure out how to make them disappear on me. Uh, there is a way, but I can't find my little note that makes that stop. But uh, Leo is easy to spot even if you don't have all those fancy lines because his head looks like a backwards question mark with Regulus as the dot on that question mark. So this is the mane of the lion. He's lying down. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Uh, his front leg is here. His body runs back like this and his tail's right there. So uh, not as bright as Orion, but there's just not a lot else around him in this part of the sky. So he's pretty easy to pick out no matter where you are uh, looking at the nighttime sky up that. By the way, we are getting to the end of March right now. You've probably heard that March comes in like a lion. Uh, that actually comes from the nighttime sky. Leo begins rising in the east right at sunset, almost to the day of the first day of March. Uh, so that's where that phrase actually comes from in the nighttime sky. So that's a brief look at the uh, nighttime sky. Uh, I am going to uh, stop sharing that now because we do have a lot to get to uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I am going to pass it off to our uh, director of the Ward Beecher Planetarium, uh, who will uh, now share with you one of his favorite topics and something he's really excited about, and that is the James Webb Space Telescope. So take it away, Dr. Durrell. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, let me just get set up here. Hope everybody can see this. Been a while since I've done this. Uh, <laughs> been a while since I've done the uh, uh, the Zoom thing. But uh, yeah, this is a a topic that's getting more and more dear to my heart. I've been using the Hubble telescope for many years, and sometime soon I certainly hope to be start using this telescope. Uh, certainly after its launch, uh, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, and uh, started releasing data. Only eight months ago, the James Webb Space Telescope has really captured people uh, with just absolute fantastic imagery, great spectra, and there's just incredible results, you know, coming out of this, you know, even now. So, uh, I just wanted to give a little primer on, uh, you know, what you're seeing, you know, what's important about the James Webb, what we're seeing, and all these kinds of things. And of course, one of the key things, and this is a nice picture of the Hubble telescope, which I'm still a big fan of. So, you know, I'm not going to be saying James Webb is it and Hubble is out. Hubble is definitely not out. Uh, but, you know, why put a telescope in space? Okay? And one of the things about, you know, people have wanted to put a telescope in space for a very, you know, very, very long time. And the idea was simply to get above the atmosphere's blurring effect. So you can naturally get nice sharper images uh, because our atmosphere actually can, you know, take a, you know, smooth out the images a little bit, make the stars, you know, twinkle and make them a bit larger than they would be otherwise. Um, and while, you know, it's kind of cool to see the stars twinkle, astronomers are not that big a fan of twinkling because um, it means the images aren't going to be very sharp. So, you know, that's one of the things about uh, putting a telescope in space is we get naturally sharper images, which is, of course, is one of the things that's really made the Hubble stand out for, you know, uh, we're coming up on the 33rd anniversary of Hubble's launch uh, wow. yeah, later in April. Sorry, Pat, I forgot to mention yeah. something before I pass it off to you. Um, oh. If you are live on Facebook, uh, feel free to, if you have questions as Dr. Durrell talks, to post the questions in the comments. We will answer them. Uh, uh, if they're simple, we'll answer them in line, but uh, we will also have a question answer at the end. So if you've got questions, feel free to share them in the comments and we will answer them as we go through or at the end. Sorry about that. That's okay. So this image is just here to show that, uh, you know, sort of the difference that between using a big, nice big telescope on the ground and just the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Okay, and this is and this is the thing that high resolution can do. So, you know, with Hubble, like I said, it really, you know, it's been so useful in, in astronomy. Made so many great discoveries using Hubble. Uh, every year, people are still, you know, writing proposals to use Hubble and to continue using it. And I'm one of them. Um, but now with James Webb, we have another tool uh, from which to really go after some of the mysteries of the universe. So the image is like, this is a Hubble picture, but just to show you a beautiful image of a galaxy. Um, again, just the sharp imagery that you can do by putting a telescope in space. But of course we're here about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it's a rather odd looking uh, object, but I can assure you it is a big telescope. Um, it collects more light than the Hubble telescope. It's also a lot more technologically complex telescope. And unlike Hubble, which was designed to be fixed, um, James Webb isn't. James Webb is in its own orbit behind the Earth, about a million kilometers back. So everything, when it, the telescope was launched, had to go out to a point we call L2, uh, where it's going to make observations for the next couple of decades. Everything had to work. You know, the, the, uh, you know everything had to unfurl properly. Everything had to work. The mirrors had to line up properly. And it all worked. So, you know, people say, well, have we, you know, what have we done lately, like with NASA and, and space and things like that? Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is not just a marvel for astronomy, but an incredible uh, thing, uh, just, a, you know, master of engineering, optical design uh, and dedication. And it's something to always keep in mind. Now, of course, the key thing, there's two key differences between Webb and Hubble. One is the Webb telescope is a bigger mirror, so it collects more light. So we should be able to see fainter things with James Webb than we could with the Hubble telescope. So there are many things out there to be discovered, just waiting to be discovered. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, however, that James, the Webb telescope is an infrared telescope, which means it is designed to collect infrared light from far away objects. In that sense, it's different. Hubble works at optical wavelengths that you or I are much more familiar with. But to do some of the science uh, that uh, James Webb was designed for, it was optimized for the infrared. Uh, so it could study things that, you know, very distant, ga very distant galaxies that you couldn't see even with Hubble. Okay, you can study uh, exoplanets around other stars more readily in the infrared. Uh, you can study star forming regions, all sorts of things like that. Uh, this picture is just a, it's the, this picture is probably over a decade old. Uh, this is a model of the James Webb Space Telescope at an astronomy meeting I was at um, and with myself underneath, just to give you an idea of scale. Okay, it's an unusual design. Uh, the big uh, hexagonal thing is the mirror. Uh, okay, and the weird sails are there to help leach all the heat away from the telescope because it's collecting infrared light, which is heat, which is heat. So the last thing we want is a lot of heat from the instruments sticking around. So those sails are there to help deflect and get some of the heat away from the instruments. This is an extremely sensitive telescope. So, but it means that observing it infrared, an extra challenge for the people uh, with this telescope is, of course, you know, making infrared images accessible to everybody. And I think they've already been doing a phenomenal job with that. Okay. And this is just a nice video of the telescope unfurling. This is, you know, kind of what happened over a week or over a few weeks, uh, about this time last year, you know, just for this thing to work. It all had to unfurl. Those sails had to come out without any glitches. Uh, the mirrors had to unfold and they had to line up perfectly because, you know, you're collecting light from distant sources and all that light has to get focused into one place. So again, also a marvel of engineering. So why infrared? Why don't we just make a bigger optical telescope? Well, there are plans in the works for a bigger optical telescope, but there are some scientific questions that we really wanted to go into the infrared and that includes seeing very distant, very young galaxies, okay? Uh, dust within galaxies helps us understand what's in galaxies. 
And again, planets around other stars is a big topic these days. And uh, you can do a lot more in the infrared by studying those. So there's a lot of advantages. And right now, like I said, it's only been eight months that you know uh, data has been taken for James Webb. So we're just beginning in the sense of discovery that's going to come from this wonderful telescope. This is just a sort of a band showing all the different types of light that there are, all the types of light from gamma rays to X-rays to ultraviolet optical light that we can see, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. And the blue here is to show this is what Hubble can look at. Hubble is an optical telescope, but it dabbles in the infrared and the ultraviolet. But James Webb is meant to go really into the infrared. And again, unlock a variety of things like even Hubble with all of its great capabilities and new cameras and everything uh, just can't do. Now, this was actually the first image released uh, way back in July and caused a bit of a stir. It was a really, you know, awe-inspiring image. And it's a distant cluster of galaxies, galaxies that are very, 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 very far away. Um, and with just incredible sharp detail when they released this image, you know, even as an astronomer, I'm just looking at this going, wow, this is amazing. You know, I've been, you know, looking at Hubble images for decades and uh, it's still jaw dropping when you see something like this. And just incredible. And like, and these images are all available online. Okay. You know, they were all released, uh, you know, uh, to the public to view. And you can see lots of things. Uh, probably the thing that dominates everybody's uh, viewpoint, though, is you see that sort of six-figured star. That's a bright star in our galaxy uh, that's in the way. Um, and the reason for that pattern, that's actually caused by the telescope itself. Uh, the uh, mirror of James Webb is hexagonal. Uh, and the support structures are in such a way that light can bounce off of it a little bit. So you get this, what's called a diffraction pattern. So you'll see this feature in lots of James Webb images. Okay. Uh, but again, it's not the star that's causing that. It's an artifact of the telescope itself. Uh, but you'll see a few more on this image. But the big fuzzy things are distant galaxies from far away. Um, and then the weird crescents, these things that look like, I'm not even sure what you would call them. <laughs> uh, you know, they're actually distant galaxies whose light has been bent by gravity, the immense gravity and dark matter surrounding the, near, the nearer galaxies. So these are like background galaxies. The images have been distorted. We call it gravitational lensing. And this first image just shows it everywhere. And we can study distant galaxies from far behind because of the effects of gravitational lensing. And then little things, uh, people may have heard that, you know, with these images, you can see galaxies that were, you know, formed, you know, not too long after the Big Bang. Uh, they'd be little tiny things on this image. I tried to point out a couple of them here in this image. And yeah, they don't look like much. They're just a few pixels on a beautiful image. Uh, but that's what little galaxies looked like a long time ago, you know, very, very far away. So when galaxies first started out, they were small. And at great distances, they're really hard to see. Now, before I show more images, I think it's also important to, you know, what are people looking at when you see uh, James Webb? images what do you what do you see um like what do the colors mean if these images are in the infrared what do the colors actually mean well first of all the images you know uh, images from james webb or hubble they don't come off the telescope in color okay so you know everybody with the cell phone cameras you take a picture it comes out in nice beautiful vivid colors uh, they do not come off that way off of uh, astronomical telescopes uh, we take images in certain filters and we take the images afterwards and you know assign them colors red green and blue and merge them together to make the color images that you see um now while infrared is something our eyes can't see so these images aren't exactly what you would see with your eye 
um, the James Webb people still use the same idea. They, the, uh, the shortest wavelengths uh, of light are given the color blue. The medium wavelengths are given the color green and the red one, the longest wavelengths are colored red. So it's the same order of things that we use for Hubble pictures. So what happens is we'll take an image, assign it red, take another image of the cluster with a different filter and assign it green, and then take other images in longer wave, uh, sorry, shorter wavelengths and assign them blue. And when you stack them afterwards, you get the color images that we see. So you'll be seeing these kinds of things in any and all the James Webb images, not just what I show, but the ones coming up over many years. And just to show you an improvement of Hubble, this is a Hubble image of that same area of space, okay, including that bright star near the middle. Well, this is a Hubble picture of that galaxy cluster. Here it is with James Webb. So I'll go back and just see the difference, okay? So when you do this kind of thing, you kind of go, even for those of us who love the Hubble telescope, this is just, like, again, mind-blowing. And this doesn't even show all the capabilities. This is a uh, an image, I think there's about 12 hours of data, so there will certainly be deeper images taken uh, in the future. This is a nebula in our galaxy. Now, this is not a James Webb picture. This is a picture taken from the ground of a nebula, which we unfortunately can't see from Youngstown, uh, but it's called the Carina Nebula. And what they did with Hubble is they took an image of a, something up at the very top right, a small area up there. Okay, this is where James Webb and Hubble are not, they're not wide field. They're very like, much like telephoto cameras. And they zoomed in on a part of the gas We zoom in. I think they've called this the cosmic cliffs after the fact. And we can see the clouds, and it's the dense parts of clouds like this where new stars are born. So these images are not just beautiful. I mean, this is this image already is a would be a great background for many computers. Um, but you see stars through the dust. Infrared is good at cutting through dust. Um, because it's longer wavelength than optical light. So if we want to see through the dust, which is often where stars are being made, infrared is the way to go. Uh, just the beautiful detail in here. And again, all of these images are not just taken for their, you know, their wow factor as far as what the images look like, but also for their scientific value. You know, these high resolution images are going to show astronomers who you know, requested this data to help them understand even more details about, you know, in what environments are stars born, okay? So these are all important questions that we're trying to understand in astronomy. Uh, again, just another comparison of Hubble, which was already a vast improvement than telescopes on the ground. So here's Hubble of the same area and James Webb. Before? after. So as good as the Hubble image is, this is what bigger mirror and more resolution can do for you. Just absolutely mind-blowing. Like I said, I don't study star formation in, in our galaxy, but I just love these images. These are just amazing. Uh, another nebula, which is the star in its final stages. Okay, called the Planetary Nebula, and you just get incredible detail from James Webb. Another early release image, uh, there are four galaxies in collision. Uh, galaxies move, everything in the universe is moving, and this includes big galaxies. Uh, this is a very famous group of colliding galaxies called Stefan's Quintet. However, it's actually only a quartet. There's actually five galaxies here. One, two, three, four. Well, there's the five that makes the quintet. However, 
one thing we've known since long, you know, for many, many decades, is this galaxy is actually not at the same distance as the other four. So while all five look like they're together, it's just these four that are part of the, the uh, galaxy collision. But you can see all sorts of weird debris, and these galaxies don't look normal. They look messed up. And this is what happens when galaxies close to one another. The gravity of the different galaxies is tugging on the stars and the other objects, and you get some rather oddly shaped galaxies as a result. Okay, so as we zoom in a little bit, just incredible detail. So again, the, those are the four galaxies that are doing the actual merging. And some of the orange you see here, this is dust, warm dust that radiates in the infrared. But it tells us that the gas, that you know, these galaxies had gas in them before they collided, and that gas is getting jammed and there's a flurry of new stars getting made as a result of this galaxy colliding. And this is what we're seeing in these areas. So again, there's lots of information in here. This is just a little side thing. Now, uh, the, the, the Christmas season has come and gone. Uh, but I always like pointing this out. A colleague of mine first pointed me, this out to me a couple of years ago. And I didn't realize this, but uh, many people have seen Stefan's Quintet before in a very different, uh, <laughs> for a very different reason. Uh, this is a still from the, the very beginning of It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, so for those of you who, you know, watched that movie, for example, over the recent holiday season. Um, yeah, this is a very old photograph, not even digital image, but a photograph of Stefan's quintet, okay, that's used at the beginning of the movie. So I'll compare the 1946 movie clip and the James Webb image. Not bad. More colliding galaxies. I love galaxies. This is called the cartwheel. This is a rare type of galaxy called a ring galaxy. And we combine the different images, we get, you know, the various spokes. This is a galaxy where a little galaxy is actually plunged through it to make this rare ring structure with all the weird spokes. Most galaxies don't look like this. Okay. And how do we know this about these things? When we look at these pictures, how do astronomers know? Well, one of the things about galaxy collisions is uh, there are many astronomers who use the fastest, most powerful supercomputers to do models and do simulations with gravity um, to find out how these things work. And uh, indeed, uh, one of my astronomy colleagues just up the road at Case Western in Cleveland, Dr. Chris Meenhouse is an expert on such things. And he and his students have made an animation of how you make a galaxy like the cartwheel. Okay, and this, you know, and we, we can actually understand these things quite well with really powerful computers. Okay, so there's the JWST image on the right and the computer simulation on the left. Now that simulation only takes a few seconds, but it's, you know, it's basically simulating what's happens over a few hundred million years. Because galaxies move fast, but I mean, they're really big. So galaxy collisions take a very long time. Uh, I threw this in uh, for those of you who like planets. Uh, this picture was released early, but kind of got passed over somehow. A uh, beautiful image of Jupiter. Not quite the Jupiter you may be used to seeing before, but it's a very deep infrared image of Jupiter. And I don't know how well it translates to uh, over Zoom. And I don't know if people can see this. So I'd be curious to know in the comments. Is Jupiter is a very faint ring. It's not a very impressive ring. It's certainly not Saturn's rings, but you can just see it. It's showing again, up. It is showing up? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's barely there. So the biggest of the planets has kind of got the wimpiest of the ring systems uh, in the outer planets. But, I mean, it's just amazing. Like I said, this, this telescope is just, you know, a little bit behind the Earth and taking incredible images of Jupiter. 
One of my favorites uh, is this picture staying in the solar system is Neptune, often one of the forgotten planets. Um, but uh, JWST took this image of Neptune and with it being the infrared image, it actually makes Neptune's, which also has very faint rings, again, they're not as good as Saturn's, um, come out really nicely. And this image is just, uh, I just love this image myself. Okay, that's them giving a talk like this. I can sort of pick the ones I like. And you can see the planet itself and its very faint rings. To us, the rings would be barely there. They're rather dark rings. They're made up of very dark dust, ice cover or dust covered ice. Okay, the, the material in Neptune's rings is so dark, it has the reflectivity of charcoal. But in the infrared, they pop up very nicely. So again, it's one of these pictures where they took it and went, wow, that's more stunning than I thought it would be. Uh, and even other things, not necessarily an image, this is the one non-image I'm going to show is, you know, uh, staying on the theme of rings. Uh, this is an asteroid-like object that orbits out past Saturn uh, called Chiriclo. It was discovered about 10 years ago now to have a ring around it. So they actually used James Webb to do very, you know, deep study of this asteroid passing in front of a distant star and looking for the dip in the light. And you can clearly see the presence of two dips, which has caused the asteroid didn't pass in front of the star, but the rings did. So we're starting to find rings around things that are really small. This thing's only 150 miles across. So we can study these things in more detail now with the Webb telescope. And there's an artist's impression of uh, Shuri Club. Now, one of the most famous images from Hubble, perhaps one of the most iconic images over 33 years, was something called the Pillars of Creation. Um, this is a, this is a ground-based image of a very large nebula in our galaxy. It's called the Eagle Nebula. And it's another one of these areas where new stars are being born. Now, deep in the middle here, okay, it's hard to do see with all this stuff. There's a lot of dust and gas here, but in the middle, you see these three finger-like things, okay, in this image. And a while ago, Hubble took an image of just this part of the nebula. And again, if, if there was a top five of Hubble images, I think this one would be in it all in that top five all the time. So James Webb wanted to go, well, what can we do with this? And they did that. And they took their, their own infrared image of the uh, pillars of creation and just another one of these images. So this is the full uh, image, like I said, in the near and mid infrared but it looks much better. Now, again, these images come out okay on, will come out okay on Zoom. Uh, but for some of these women, especially this one, if you actually go to NASA's website, you know, or the James Webb or the European website on with web images, you may want to download some of these, the high resolution versions yourself and actually see the incredible detail that is in these things. So again, so what are we looking at? These dense brownish things are regions of gas with dust in them. And these are like denser clumps in the nebula. Uh, stars can't just form anywhere. They have to form where there's enough gas and dust to do so. And it's inside these kind of thicker areas where you make new stars. And the other thing, but now the thing about James Webb, which is different than Hubble, is that with infrared, you can actually see through the dust more easily and in the background, all these stars, these have nothing to do with the nebula, but it's just a beautiful background on its own. So again, this is one of those images, you know, if you have the bandwidth sometime in the time, download it yourself on your computer and have a look, because uh, it really is uh, nothing short of amazing. And here's the comparison side by side of the two images. So the Hubble picture is on the left, and the near-infrared James Webb image is on the right. 
This was a little known nebula before Hubble and Hubble sort of turned it into uh, from a nebula point of view, kind of a superstar. And, uh, you know, the Eagle Nebula is now much more well known as a result of all of that. This is a new image. Uh, this is a star in its, this is a very massive star in its later stages of light. This is called a Wolf Ray A star, uh, which is the really bright thing in the middle. But what all that stuff around it, it is gas that used to be part of the star. This is a type of massive star. This star is about 30 or 40 times the mass of the sun. And they're very unstable. And what uh, these stars are doing is they're basically losing mass at a very high rate. Okay, and some of that mass, uh, which used to be part of the star, is getting lit up by the massive star. Okay, these are very rare type of stars, but they're you know what happens when you have an extremely bright, luminous, massive star, uh, you know, as part of the evolution of such an object. And again, you can see those diffraction spikes everywhere in this image. I, one of the things I study, I study globular clusters, which are big, massive, uh, spherical clusters of stars. And uh, uh, one of the first early, they, they, they took this data early, but didn't release uh, colored images until uh, last month. This is the edge of one of these star clusters. You can see the stars kind of more and more of them up to the upper left. And, you know, with the resolution of James, you can start seeing just all, all these little dots, any little dot you see is a star in this cluster. And many of these stars are a little bit less massive than the sun. So every little dot you can see is a star we can measure. There's a little zoom in. A couple brighter stars, some dimmer ones. And again, uh, just incredible detail. This was taken with the ground-based telescope. A lot of these stars would be all morphed together poor resolution even galaxies there's a little bit of music here but some galaxies have very very bright nuclei it's like the very middle of the galaxy can outshine the rest of the galaxy and those are areas where yeah, these are areas where supermassive black holes, which are a normal part of galaxies. Okay? Most galaxies have supermassive black holes in them. And when they feed, when they actually, you know, it, you know, take in gas and mass and things, they can actually fuel energy outside of the black hole. And the it's like the center of the galaxy has become a lighthouse. This is bright, bright object. So some galaxies are like this. Our galaxy is not like this. We do have a supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy, but it's not very active right now. So we're not seeing this kind of activity in it. But some galaxies have a lot of this. And again, this is easy stuff uh, with short images with James Webb. And then this was just a random, they really, this was just a random. <laughs> image of space and they weren't even focusing on any one particular object uh but they uh they again they put the images together they made a color image and it's just you know you can see distant galaxies little tiny things and then you sort of got this big kind of galaxy in the foreground this nice spiral galaxy nice little zoom in so really this is just i mean i don't even know what you would call it this is just random space uh, image, uh, just showing you the beauty of galaxies, both near and far. So this is the thing with the James Webb Space Telescope is it has done an already incredible amount of work. Like I said, it's only eight months in of actual observations. Um, and the images I've shown you are just sort of the start of this. There are going to be so many fantastic discoveries, things that we just don't know right now that are going to come out. For all I know, they'll have more announcements next week. Uh, just earlier this week, they announced that they had taken a spectrum of an exoplanet and found all sorts of different molecules in the atmosphere of a distant planet. One of the things that James Webb was designed for 
It didn't make for a nice, pretty image. But, you know, new discoveries are basically coming almost every week now. So, again, this is really the tip of the iceberg. Okay. More cool images are going to be coming, maybe some next week. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So, for, you know, for people interested in this sort of thing, you know, you're going to see lots of wonderful things. Uh, and uh, not just wonderful from, you know, everybody's point of view. Uh, as an astronomer myself, I study galaxies and I study nearby galaxies. But this is, you know, just jaw dropping images on all sorts of aspects of astronomy. Uh, matter of fact, one thing I'll note is uh, I, I, there's not really anything to show, but, you know, to, to get time on these telescopes, to actually get data, you know, as astronomers, you actually have to write proposals, okay? You have to write good proposals, you know, uh, every year and, you know, saying, I want to use James Webb because I want to study this. I need to use these filters and take these images. Uh, I'm on a proposal that got submitted a month ago. Uh, we probably won't hear for a month or two, uh, but it's begun. Now, right now, everybody and their dog uh, is applying to use the James Webb because, you know, Every you know, it's the new kid on the block, and there's lots of cool things it can do. But you know, it's one of these things you can't win if you don't play. So, at least from a point of view of myself, as part of an international team of astronomers, we want to study some uh, dwarf galaxies uh, in our in the universe. Uh, we put in a proposal, so we're just kind of waiting and hoping. So maybe in a couple months we'll hear good news. Uh, I really hope so. I really want to start playing with some James Webb data myself. But on that note, uh, like I said, James Webb is the new thing. The images are coming out. Uh, I want to make it clear to everybody, James Webb is not a replacement for the Hubble telescope. Because remember, Hubble is an optical, ultraviolet, and a little bit of infrared telescope. So there are lots of things that Hubble can do that James Webb cannot do. And I think that's very important to stress. Um, like I said, I'm still working on three different projects that are using Hubble data. And there are more, pro more proposals that we're working on to use Hubble. We're hoping to get a few more years out of the Hubble telescope, but some of the science I like to do needs the Hubble telescope. And uh, so, you know, I'm not letting go of Hubble anytime soon. I love the Hubble and I'll always have a flag. You know, I love Hubble. Uh, it's still going strong after 33 years. I mean, that's just amazing. And again, uh, until the batteries run out or the uh, cameras go start going squirrely, uh, I'm going to be applying to use Hubble because uh, there's lots of more fantastic images and lots of interesting science to do. Uh, and other astronomers agree, uh, even this past year, even with James Webb out there, you know, people will submit about a thousand proposals a year to use the Hubble telescope. Okay, so Hubble's not dead yet, folks, uh, but James Webb will hopefully keep running for a couple of decades and it's going to be amazing. So with that, at least wet, maybe wet your appetite on some of the cool things that James Webb can do. Up the share and go back to our wonderful team here. Uh, just a couple, just of, a comments couple of comments for you, for you. Uh, that we got. Uh, Johnny says his dog has put in several requests for the James Webb Space Telescope, and he's very hopeful. Um, and Eric points out that uh, uh, James Webb is the hot rod, Hubble is the reliable work truck. And uh, we do it have is, one it question is. for you. Uh, mm -hmm. James asks, how long did it take from start to finish uh, the Webb telescope and are space programs already working on the newest version? Um, it took decades. Uh, James Webb has been delayed for years. Um, people were talking about Hubble's replacement, even though it's not really a replacement, but the next big thing in the 1990s. Okay, so we're going back, I don't remember the exact year, but I would say about 25 years ago that think that the wheels were turning 
with Hubble going up, well, what's next? Um, and it was built, like I said, it's, it's quite expensive. It's a very, like I said, it's an amazing high technology telescope and a lot of new technology had to be used to make this work. I and mean, it's not, James Webb is not Hubble 2.0, okay? Different mirrors, different structures, different things had to be designed to make this telescope work. So it's not just a case of, well, we'll take what we did with Hubble and just make it bigger. Uh, James Webb isn't that. Um, so the first question is, yeah, two and a half decades. Um, but yes, people are already having discussions on what are the next space telescopes. Um, they may not be bigger than James Webb, but some are going to be optimized for optical. People are already talking about the, the Nancy Roman telescope, which should be launched in a few years. It's kind of a medium-sized telescope, but it's going to be an optical telescope. Uh, and people are, you know, there's already meetings underway of people discussing, you know, big space telescopes that cover more area, like, kind of like they're more wide angle than, you know, James Webb and Hubble are very, you know, you know, their images cover very tiny parts of space. But if you want to do large surveys and look for lots of different things, you need something with a little bit more area. And uh, those discussions are underway. There's one called Louvoir. Uh, there's a few other, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but yes, uh, discussions are already going on the next things. Um, and, uh, and so more cool things to happen because right now people like me who do like, you know, there are some studies in the ultraviolet and the optical, James Webb can't do that. So we're kind of going, okay, is the next telescope going to be in those wavelengths so we can go even deeper than Hubble, but in the optical. So there's always going to be a need for that. Uh, like I said, there are still things that Hubble can do. James Webb can't. And if we can build even better, bigger, uh, more advanced with better cameras, uh, like a Hubble, you know, there's gonna be all sorts of new things we can learn there. So uh, great questions. Yeah, great question. That's, yeah, they are always thinking about that. They're not, astronomers not one to rest on their laurels. They're like, oh, this is cool. What's the next one? Yes, they're, yeah. And on multiple fronts too. It's not just one. There's talk about lots of different instruments that, you know, oh, after seeing what James could, what can we do? What can, what's next? What cool thing can we do next? Uh, you know, so yes, that is definitely all underway. But it does take a long time from when the first thought comes to when it gets launched. And James Webb is, like I said, two and a half decades in the, in the making in that sense. So uh, Debbie and Gina, thank you for the wonderful images. Uh, and our <laughs> next presenter that's going to be doing a show in just a few weeks here on the uh, Keep Looking Up uh, Facebook page, Eleni has a question for you. Uh, she mentioned, uh, you mentioned that your James Webb Space Telescope proposal focuses on dwarf galaxies. What specific aspect of dwarf galaxies are you looking to study? What is the benefit of using Webb versus other telescopes? Uh, well, one of the things we want to do is we want to study uh, in nearby dwarf galaxies. They have star clusters in them that we call globular clusters. And with uh, the high resolution of James Webb, uh, we can actually see those clusters, not as little dots, but as resolved disks. Uh, and we can study them more effectively. And there's uh, a couple of these dwarf galaxies that have got lots of globular clusters, which means they should have lots of dark matter in them. Uh, so we wanna understand the dynamics of that. So we put in a proposal to go after one of these targets. Um, but like I said, it's a neat idea, but I mean, there's gonna be so many people, uh, including that first commenter's dog, uh, you know, putting in proposals. You know, it's, it's a cool idea, but wow, there's a lot of competition right now. Um, so it's one of these things where it's like, we'll put one in, see how well it does. And if it doesn't make it, and many won't, uh, you know, we'll, you know, use it, collect things up for the next time. Um, cause and that happened for many years with Hubble. I mean, I'm on many projects where we had to apply three years in a row before the proposal hit and we got the data and we're doing cool things and we're publishing results, but some of them were, you know, <laughs> three times, you know, three times before they got, uh, they got accepted. And it's just, that's the game. There's, 
you know, you might not think there's a lot of astronomers out there, but there are quite, you know, there are quite a few astronomers out there and a lot of them want to use web and they all have great ideas. Um, and there's just not enough time in a year for James Webb to get to all of them. There just isn't. So a lot of proposals, especially these first few years, aren't going to make it. But I'm, you know, I'm just like, again, you, you can't win if you don't play at all. So it's like, so here's oh, hoping. My wife with the lottery ticket, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I got that too. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's like, oh, yeah, we want to hit this thing. Oh, but that, we could do that with James Webb. Oh, okay. Write that up. Does this make sense? Yeah, this works. Okay. You know, talk about it with the colleagues. It was submitted by uh, one of my colleagues uh, over in, in Austria. And, um, you know, it's part of international collaboration. And we're just hopeful. And like I said, we just keep waiting the emails so after a couple of months. We're hoping we get the, <laughs> but, you know, we also have to be realistic. All right. Well, that looks like about all for the comments. So uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Durrell, for coming on to our virtual broadcast. For those of you who don't know, and probably most of you do by now, the reason we are doing this virtually instead of actually being in the planetarium is on January 9th, we did have a fire in the planetarium. Uh, we have gotten our final report uh, from our assessors, and that's going to the insurance people now. Then the insurance people will tell us how much money we're getting back. Then we know what needs to be done when, uh, but it's unlikely we will be able to uh, do uh, our video presentations in the planetarium uh, for quite a while. Uh, so uh, we are doing these virtual shows to keep things going with that. Hopefully, uh, we'll keep your interest going and we'll see you back at the planetarium. Speaking of the planetarium, I will remind you, for those of you who joined us after the beginning of the show, we actually do have a program in the planetarium tomorrow. Uh, that is So You Got a Telescope. Our friends from the Mahoning Valley Astronomical Society uh, will be here. Uh, and uh, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., you can come anytime between 3 and 5 p.m. If you have a telescope you're not 100% sure how to use, or you're interested in purchasing a telescope and you don't know what to look for, uh, they will be there to guide you uh, with using your telescope and also with choosing a telescope. So uh, you can come anytime between 3 and 5 uh, to the planetarium, and also you get to see how bad our dome looks after yep. the fire so uh yep. what can you do uh and if you come so, out tomorrow aubrey and uh, aubrey and i will be there as well so to answer any of your questions ask absolutely. any questions yeah, about telescopes. yep so you know that that's the thing we, you know, we if people get a telescope we want to make sure that they get to use it um and get something out of it especially as we start getting it starts getting warmer now and people are more like well go outside and look at things so uh yeah, by all means, do so. So, yeah, and we're happy to have our friends from the Mahoning Valley Astronomical Society Absolutely. out with us as well. So uh, yep. the next time we will be live here will be on April 14th, as mentioned, the aforementioned Eleni, our uh, planetarium alum, Eleni, will be with us, and she is going to be talking about Pluto and Kuiper Belt objects, so stuff in the outer reaches of the solar system. Uh, so we look forward to that. That's so, going to be uh, awesome. So, so uh, yeah, and she's uh, done a lot of research on this topic, and uh, she does a great presentation. So we hope you will join us again on April 14th uh, for that. We hope to see you tomorrow in the planetarium. And until then, keep looking up. <laughs>